see what it, what it is really like. And the scene opens up with John being brought before the very throne room of God. And what John first saw dominates everything else in this scene. So the very first thing we're going to look at is the throne of God. The throne of God. Now as I began to study about the throne of God, I, have you ever done a quick word search in your Bible? You go in, if you have a Bible software, it's easier. You know? uh, I remember the days of when you open your Bible, and I, I literally have a Bible where one time I wanted to see every time in the book of Genesis, you know, Elohim was used, capital G, small o, small d, or every time Yahweh was used, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So if you look at one of my Bibles, I literally have, every time God is mentioned in Genesis, circled, and every time the Lord is mentioned, you know, boxed. I'm so thankful now that you just click a little button on your computer, open up a program like eSword, click Bible, click search, type the word, pick the book you want to search in, hit enter, and before you can blink, it says, that's used this many times, and here's every time it's used. It's like, wow, I like that one better. A little bit more work the other way, you remember it more, right? Um, but it's just nice to be able to have it at your fingers. So, um, out of the 22 chapters, a bit, bit, bit of Revelation trivia for you, ready? Out of the 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, there are only how many chapters in which the word throne does not appear. Anybody have a guess? Because this is, remember the entitled this entire series studying the book of Revelation is entitled He Reigns. Right? And when a king reigns, where does he reign from? A throne. So, of the 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, how many of them don't mention throne? He's going with three. Adele's going with four. Do we have any other takers? Ying's got two. Any other takers? Pharaoh's got one, and Cassandra's jumping in there with her mom and all going one. He'll go 15. Anybody else? He'll go five. Brother June got it. Only five out of the 22 chapters don't mention the word throne. Hey, we can have a little bit of fun saying the Bible, right? You know Right? Should have said the number you guess is the number you times your normal offering to fit today. <laughs> that would have changed everyone but one, negative one, zero. No. Uh, just joking. But only out of the 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, there are only five chapters in which the word throne does not appear. So that tells you this is a very prominent word and prominent theme throughout this entire book. Okay? Now, God is seen as towering over all human events. Everything we see, I think that, that puts it this way, everything you see on TV, and, and we, we've seen some unusual events last year or so on, on television, the news and all that, if you believe half of everything is reported. And we've seen some very sad things. You know, this, this Christmas will never be the same for some families in Tasmania. You know, there, there's some very sad things we've seen. But I'll tell you this, nothing takes the place of God on his earth. He's over all human events. Nothing takes him by surprise. To many in our day, the fact that there is a God and that He is on the throne of the universe goes directly against most people's secular thinking. They hate the idea of divine authority. A lot of people, you know, people today really don't like authority. They just don't like authority. And let's be honest. Naturally, in our human flesh, do we like someone telling us what to do? Probably not, right? You know, everyone they I always find it funny. I crack up laughing every time I talk to one person. Uh, no one's gonna tell me what to do. I'm gonna join the military. And Dell and I have the same reaction. Have you not heard of something called a boot camp? Have you not heard of the word drill sergeant? 
Their entire job is to tell you what to do. Their entire job is to get you to the point where you don't even question what they tell you what to do. You just do it instantly without, without asking. Correct? Then there's the person, well, no one's, I'm tired of working for, for a boss in a corporation. No one's got to tell me what to do. I'm going to start my own business. Oh, yeah? Then you get a lot of people telling you what to do. Every customer you have tells you what to do. You, then you can find out you got a wonderful thing called the Australian Taxation Office. They tell you a lot of what you cannot and can do. Yes? Uh, then you've got, you know, government institutions, you know, that put out all these different things. They tell you what you can and can't do. There's, nowhere in life are you going to go where you're not going to be under authority some way, shape, or form that's going to tell you some things what you can and cannot do. It's just the fact. You say, why? That's the way God intended it because God is reigning on his throne. And I've, I've met some people, you know what? And I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, when I get, you know, in church, I'm tired of being in church and everyone's telling me what to do, so one day I'm gonna be the pastor so I can tell everyone what to do. Can I tell you something? As a pastor, you still don't tell everyone what to do. Right? And even as the pastor, you still have authority because you know what? There's certain checks and balances in place. Um, you know, we were, we were looking at getting some of the Christmas gifts that we normally do, and, and, um, Katie said to me, well, why don't you just take the card and put it in the ATM machine, take cash out and put cash in the card? And I looked at her and I said, I can't do that. And she said, well, why can't you do that? Cards work that way. I said, well, because the church constitution states that these little cards cannot be used to withdraw cash. So that way we have an account for it and there's an accountability thing. Oh, that makes sense. So even though I'm the pastor, you all told me what I couldn't do to do, right? You say, why? Because if someone just starts walking with a church card, putting it in the ATM machine, taking out cash, there's no telling where that money goes, right? It's completely untraceable, and that's not good. There's always good to have authority and accountability in every area of life. And so uh, here we are, and despite the fact that what people may or may not like, we see God on the throne. Now, as we look at the next thing, the figure on the throne is God. The figure on the throne is God. Look at chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne, and he that set was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, that was, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like onto an emerald. Well, as we look at this, we see some different things. We see the first stone is jasper. Jasper. Now, jasper is often a bright like crystal. Normally, jasper's color is affected by the mineral in the ground, and they appear opaque with a tinge of red, yellow, brown, or green in color. Right? So it's really affected by what it's around. It takes on the color of what it's around, kind of. Now, with these things, but there is, but, but as you see here, it's, it's perfect and it's crystal clear. It's often used to describe dominance and holy perfection. Dominance and holy perfection. Well, is that a good description of God if it's using Jasper? Yes. All right? And his, God's holiness, or his holiness is unaffected by those things around him. It doesn't matter what's going on around God. God is still holy. God is still on the throne. He is still in charge. It is perfect holiness. Perfect holiness. Now, the second stone is a sardine stone. Sardine stone. Anyone know what a sardine stone is? Anyone know what color a sardine stone is? It is red. It is a red stone. Alright, the sardine stone is a beautiful, glowing, blood red stone. Right? The sardine stone is like blood red. Well, it's blood when oxygen hits it because blood is not usually red until oxygen. You know what I mean. 
<laughs> and there's going to be someone, you know, but it's not right. Right? You realize that bugs not everything. That's why when you look at your vein, it's not right there. Anyways, it's blood red, okay? Now this stone suggests the son who gave his blood for an atonement for our sins. He is the Lamb of God. Alright, so here the stone will be a picture of that. Now there's a third stone. A third interesting stone or a third thing that represents a represents represented by a stone and that is emerald john saw a great rainbow encircling the throne of god all right now green is green is usually an emerald color now this is a bright varying shade of emerald circling the throne of heaven symbol it can be symbolized the holy spirit um, administering the holiness and redemption of god to all creation now here's an interesting side note about rainbows have you realized that all rainbows are really circles you just can only see a certain portion of it so we talk about a rainbow encircling the throne of God. You know, rainbows are bows, right? Rainbows. You know, really, that is a circle. We just only see the portions visible to us. And no, there's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. But if you find one, let me know. Uh, all right. Um, and uh, depending on where you grew up, there's no cereal at the end of the rainbow either. There's no Lucky Charms or anything like that. Or, um, it's just a rainbow, but it's a complete circle. Uh, when you see a rainbow in the sky, you're only seeing that part. And, and we stand on the ground and look at the rainbow, half of that refractive image is hidden below the horizon. The best way to view a rainbow is from an airplane. If you ever view a rainbow from an airplane, you can almost see the entire circle of a rainbow. Because it's not the, the horizon is not hidden when you're above it. Um, it's a really interesting thing. And so uh, it's interesting that that's a rainbow and circles the throne of God. Now, because why? The rainbow has always been a symbol of God. And, and if you notice, the rainbow in Scripture is always red, you know, orange, yellow, or green, blue, indigo, and violet. Right? But other rainbows leave one of those colors out. Not quite the same. See, how do you remember the colors of the rainbow? Roy G. Biff. Yeah. I've got all sorts of weird things for remembering science from my teacher. Um, but when they decommissioned Pluto from a planet, they really messed up the little thing that he used to teach us. My very eager mother just served us nine pickles. Now it's my very eager mother just served us. Well, I don't know. Nine. Nine what? Anyways. Let's see, what's that? What's this one? Right. Next thing. Uh, the 24 seats and elders. The 24 seats and elders you see in verse 4. Now, when you come to these 24 seats and elders, I'm just going to tell you there are three different views and interpretation on these, these elders. Okay? I'm going to tell you what all three are. And, and then I'll give you my opinion as to what I think they are. You say, what does that work? That and five dollars might buy you a cup of coffee, right? Um, but there are three views on it, just so that way you know there's three different views about it. Um, and we'll go from there. All right, the first view. The first view. The 24 represent the entire heavenly priesthood. The entire heavenly priesthood. All believers, Old and New Testament, are priests. All worship. Therefore, whoever the 24 elders are, they represent a large group who have been redeemed. Okay? So, some people say, hey, these, these 24 elders, 
um, you know, or represent the entire heavenly uh, priesthood, a mixture of both Old Testament and New Testament believers. Okay? Could be. Now, second view. The second view holds that the 24 represent just those from the raptured, glorified church. Just those from the raptured, glorified church. These 24 um, elders represent only those from the, the church that's raptured. Okay? But then there's a third view. And I could, I'll tell you right now, I lean more towards this third view. Does that make sense? All right? Uh, the third view is this. Uh, the third view is that it represents two groups. The first group is the 12 tribes or Israel. And the 12 apostles, the church. Saints in two different dispositions. Say so why? Well, because when Jesus was talking about the 12 tribes, you know, and you, and you, you go to heaven, there's 12 stones, and each stone has what? The 12 tribes on them. Okay? So it makes sense in my mind that these 24 elders, 12 of them would represent one of each of the tribes. And the Bible, Jesus did promise the 12 apostles that they will rule and reign with him. Yes? So then, well, you say, does it matter which view it is? It doesn't really matter that much. Um, but those are the three views of who the 24 elders are. Um, study out. You say, in the end, what's happened? There's 24 elders around the throne of God that worship Him, correct? We don't know the exact identities. Isn't it funny that we always like to know the identities of, of people that God doesn't actually give us the identities to? Have you ever noticed that? We always wonder, I wonder who these 24 elders are. It doesn't tell us who they are. In the end, they're in heaven worshiping God. That's really what matters, right? Uh, but it's sometimes it's fun to look at. So there you go. The, the three views of who these are. And then we see that they are, have white raiment and gold crowns. White raiment and gold crowns. Oh, the angels do appear in white. White garments, you know, can be referring to believers who are dressed in white. Because uh, you go back to the church of Laodicea, and what does Jesus tell them? Make sure they have white raiment, right? When the church returns with Christ at the second coming, how is everyone who returns with Christ dressed? In white raiment. All right, so we'll go there. Now, we go to these interesting things. We go to um, these different, these four beasts, right? And if you look at verse 7, so the first beast was like a lion, the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And so as we look at these, um, there are four different ones. Now, these four different things, we've seen this type of image before, you know, in Ezekiel. And we saw each one of these images also represents, isn't it, when we look at the Gospels, Jesus was presented in all four of these ways, correct? The Lion of the tribe of Judah, uh, he was, you know, God, he was a servant, and all those, all right? So, um, we, we look at that now. They also can represent four different things, all right? Uh, they can represent the created world. The Talmud, or the, the Hebrew Bible, saw these creatures as the four primary forms of life in God's creation. They saw the lion as the king of the beast, the calf as the king of domestic animals, the man is the king or pinnacle of God's creation, and the ego is the king of the power. So, in Talmud tradition, uh, these four represent the created world. Okay? Now, uh, they are representative of God's attributes or qualities. Representative of God's attributes or qualities. 
The lion represents his majesty and his omnipotence. The calf represents his patience and continual labor. The man represents his intelligence and rational power. And the eagle represents his sovereignty and supremacy in things. So we see that. Third thing, uh, they represent Israel as they camped around the tabernacle under the four banners. You know, they had the four banners, they would all camp around the tabernacle. So what do you mean? Well, in the book of Numbers, we find Reuben's standard symbolized man, Dan's standard symbolized an eagle, Ephraim's standard symbolized a calf, and Judah's standard symbolized by what? A lion, a lion of the tribe of Judah. All right, so there's, there's that. And then finally, uh, some see them as re representing Christ and the Gospels. He said, Matthew presented Christ as king, the lion. Mark presented Christ as a servant, the calf. Luke, Christ as man, not man, humanity. And John, Christ as God, the eagle. And so if you, if you look at these four animals, uh, you can look at them in multiple different ways. You can look at them how the Talmud looked at them. You can look at them, you know, how... They represented God's qualities and attributes. You look at them how they represented Israel in, in those four ways. They would divide the, the, the encampment. Or you can look at them as seeing, um, representing Christ in the Gospels. And, you know, you say, well, which way is correct? I don't think it really matters. It kind of gives you the same picture, doesn't it? It kind of gives you the same picture of God in every way you look at them and in how he was represented to mankind. Whether that's representing the Israel, whether that's representing the church, whether that's representing anyone, it uh, gives you kind of the same thing. Now, uh, the scene in heaven culminates in worship directed toward God and His throne. So how does this whole scene of the throne of God end? Well, these elders are all on their face worshiping God. Can I tell you something? I think that's what we're going to do predominantly in all of eternity. Worship God. Right? You know? Um, and that'd be okay. I think that'd be fine. Now, in this passage, and in chapter 5, we are given five great hymns of praise. Five great hymns of praise. The choir in Revelation 5 gradually increases in size. As you read Revelation chapter 5, the choir grows. Revelation 5, 8, look at it. And, he had, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having one of them harps and golden uh, vials full of odor, which are the prayers of the saints. And so as you, as you go, um, it, it goes from those people, then it continues to grow as it goes, and then... Uh, look at verse 20, uh, verse 10. And has made us unto the, our, our, our God and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And then we've got 24 elders involved in here. And then you keep going up, and it adds angels, and, and it keeps going all the way through the book. All right? And we see chapter 4 is really the hymn of creation. The hymn of creation. Chapter 4 is the hymn of creation. As you study chapter 5, you will find that chapter 5 is the hymn of redemption. The hymn of the redeemed. Singing praises to God. As we think about this, we conclude this chapter... Chapter 4 ends with four living creatures and 24 elders worshiping in awe and wonder as God prepares for judgment. All creatures owe their very existence to God as their creator. You're here this morning, you owe your very existence to God your creator. So how could we not worship Him? You see, even these, these unusual things you see in heaven, guess what? 
They owe their existence to God as their creator. All the angelic beings, who created them? God did. We can debate on when he created them, but we know he created them, correct? Remember one time in, in Bible college, we had to write a paper based on when we thought God created the angels. I thought, well, that's a whole lot of speculation, isn't it? Anyone know when God created the angels? I know this. It was at least before the end of the Garden of Eden, and it was before the Garden as well. You say, why? Because the devil had to fall before that, or else he wouldn't have been on earth, correct? Other than that, your guess is as good as mine, right? Sometime in eternity past, before the creation of mankind, at least, yes? In the end, we just know this, God created them. Full stop. So even all these angelic beings owe their very existence to God. All right? All creatures do. As chapter 4 concludes, it is a fitting introduction to chapter 5 as their increasing choir of praise lifts their voice to the glory of God's Son, Jesus Christ. As the Redeemer, as they say with one voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. And you're going to find, as we said in the book of Revelation, that is going to be an overarching phrase and thing that you're going to see is, well, who's worthy to open the book? Well, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. And really, they're, they're worshiping the Lamb that was slain for the salvation of the world. And you know what? We should be thankful for that. And, and now as we begin to go through the book of Revelation, for the most part, we're going to be shifting our, our view of things from an earthly view. Are there going to be some things that are going to take place on earth? Absolutely. Correct? The, the judgments will take place for all those sort of things. But while they're taking place on earth, there's simultaneously things taking place in heaven. And everything, whether it's taking place on earth or in heaven, is all taking place because God's still reigning and ruling from His throne in heaven. So hopefully we can you know, be able to just explore, continue to explore this book and be able to see, you know what? Yes, are there some things to come that are going to be very difficult? Yes. But guess what? They shouldn't cause us to fear. To say why? Because we know the one who reigns. Correct? We know the one who's in control. And uh, we, we worship that one. And uh, as we think about Christmas, what a fitting way to think about the one who will worship uh, for all of eternity. Why? Well, because he was born in that manger, lived that sinless life, died on the cross for your sins and mine, was buried in the borrowed tomb, and rose again the third day. And now he says, whosoever will may come. I just like that's the whole Christmas story, like from beginning to end. And it all ends with... Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, we thank you for this time together in your word. Lord, I pray that you help us this morning as we uh, finish our Christmas series and look to uh, those things. And Lord, also as we, after that, have a time uh, to fellowship around the table over a meal. And Lord, just have a little bit of fun uh, just celebrating Christmas time. Lord, may everything that's said and done today bring honor and glory to you. But most importantly, may... We give you the praise and the glory that you're, just, you're doing, you're deserved. And Lord, if the best thing that can ever happen is to be anyone here today that knows your Savior. Lord, make your day be that day they come to know you. And Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.